Well, here we go. This is our interview and discussion with Vivek J. Tiwari, the writer and creator of the graphic novel, The Fifth Beetle, the number one graphic novel of 2013, and is published by Dark Horse, that tells the as of yet untold story of Beatles manager, Brian Epstein. Enjoy. Hello. Hey, is this uh, Vivek Tiwari? Yes, I'm so sorry to keep you guys waiting. I was just getting off another call, running oh, a few minutes late this morning. <laughs> Hope you guys are well. Yeah, we're well. It's just uh, me. I'm, I'm Jeremiah, and uh, my wife, uh, Stephanie, is here as well, who's the resident Beatles expert. Excellent. Nice to meet you both. So, um, am, I, am I remembering correctly that you guys might have a little one on the way? Yes. yes. Congratulations. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, how how close are you? Uh, it's in March, two months. Oh my gosh, Stephanie, I hope you are feeling well. Uh, yeah, I'm feeling pretty good. Awesome. Is this your first? Yeah. Yeah, I have a, I have a two year old and a five year old. Um, it's amazing. Kids are kids are awesome. I'm so happy for you both. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, it's a magical, magical time. You guys are you guys are gonna love it. It's not easy, so I won't lie to you about that. <laughs> the newborn days are, are are I'm 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 glad to not have a newborn, but uh but boy it is uh it is the most rewarding thing I have ever done. You know, it's it's just yeah, it's magical. I get my kid. <laughs> yeah, it's oh it's so great. I'm so happy for you both. <laughs> I mean uh well. yeah. Anyway, sorry. I'm just I'm a, I'm big on kids. I, I love being a dad, so I'm just very happy for you guys. Congrats. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, I guess the best way to start is why don't you introduce yourself a little bit on who you are and what exactly the Fifth Beetle is? That's really simple. Yeah. So my name is Vivek Tiwari, and the Fifth Beetle is a graphic novel and a forthcoming feature film based on the life of Brian Epstein, who is the Beatles manager. So. What made you want to make a graphic novel, or which some people would just refer to as a comic book, from about the Beatles? Like, what what inspired you to make a graphic novel about this when there's tons of books about the Beatles? Why why a graphic novel? Well, there are a lot of books about the Beatles, but there are no books about Brian Epstein, who is their manager. Um, the Fifth Beatle is literally the only book about Brian in print, uh, which is kind of a stunning fact. I mean, you can you can literally find books about John Lennon's astrologist, and you can't find a book about Brian Epstein prior to the Fifth Beatles uh, release last November. So my my, my main uh, reason for wanting to to release a book was was to, to share the Brian Epstein story with the world. Um, Brian was uh, the man who discovered the Beatles when they were playing uh, basement clubs in Liverpool. They weren't even the most popular band in Liverpool, and they really weren't going anywhere. And, and he saw in the Beatles a band that that, uh, that would push artistic boundaries. He said that they were going to be bigger than Elvis and that they would elevate pop music to an art form. Uh, and he saw a group that had a great message of love to share with the world, and he thought that was very worthy and important. And uh, and he saw that, that in the Beatles a chance for him to really to make a lasting impact in the world. And so he took them on as manager, and he led them to you know the unprecedented international stardom that we that we know uh, that we know all about. But many of those books you referred to have already covered. Um, you know, and and he really was responsible for that. He he packaged and presented the band. He came up with their suits, their haircuts. Uh, he orchestrated the performance-ending bows that the, that they were famous for. He got them a record deal when no one wanted to sign them. He convinced Ed Sullivan to book them when a British band had never made an impact in the United States before. Um, you know, he really was a, a trailblazer and was responsible for the, for the business uh, end of their success and for spreading their message to the entire world. I mean, we're, we're about to celebrate the uh, 50th anniversary of the bands coming over to the United States. And the truth was, if it wasn't for Brian, they would never have come to the United States. Ed Sullivan did not want to book the band. He thought the Beatles were a novelty act, and, and it was Brian's convincing that, that you know, and it's covered, the, the story is covered in The Fifth Beatle, you know, that, um, that got him to, to bring the band, to book them, and to bring them over to the U.S. So, you know, if there's a great Beatles story in there, and, and, uh, and I wanted to, you know, I feel like that's a story that has not been told in, in previous Beatles books. However, you know, if you can let me ramble for for another minute, you know, the, what really attracted me to the Brian Epstein story was the human side of the story. He was gay and Jewish and from Liverpool at a time when those were three significant obstacles. 
It was a felony to be gay. It was literally against the law in the United Kingdom. Um, there was, the country was rampant with anti-Semitism, and Liverpool was a town that had no cultural influence. So for this gay Jewish man to be running around Liverpool saying, I found a local band and they're going to big, be bigger than Elvis, it was ludicrous, and, and people really laughed at him. And, and that was something that I could really relate to, you know, him being an outsider, a bit of a misfit in his chosen field, and having a big dream that seemed impossible and laughable. You know, I, I don't want to suggest that I've had the obstacles that Brian had in his life, but, um, you know, I'm a first-generation American. My parents are of Indian origin origin by way of Guyana, South America, and you don't see a lot of people of my ethnicity and my background working in fields like graphic novels, Broadway, film, television, you know, the fields that, that I cho chose to work in. So I could kind of relate to that sense of being an outsider in your chosen field and, and having a big dream uh, and being told by everyone around you that, that, that that dream is crazy and that people like you don't do these kind of things. And, and, uh, and you know, so that's why the Brian Epstein story was so inspiring to me. And, and it's the human side of his story that really uh, made me want to tell it. So that's kind of the, my, my motivation behind it. Great, and um, you know, I, I I've been to Guyana and I've been to lots of places in the Caribbean, so oh, I can, wow. yeah, you can relate that way because Guyanese are like Haitians in some ways in some places in the Caribbean, and they aren't considered they aren't considered to be cultured or from a, a very educated place, and they're re usually really poor, and a lot yeah. of people look down on them. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I'll be the first to acknowledge it. You know. I mean, Guyana is, you know, the only reason there are Indians in Guyana is because of colonialism, you know, it's because it was a British colony, and uh, and my, my great-grandparents um, moved from India to Guyana basically like indentured servants, as much as I hate to use that term, it's just the honest truth. They went, moved from one colony to the next seeking a better life. You know, they were, they were really one step away from being an, in, in, an indentured servant. So, yeah, anyway. So when, it, when it comes to this graphic novel, um. The art is the art inspired from like the old Beatles uh, cartoons because it really looks it. Yes and no. I mean, you know, the the uh, so, you know, we we wanted. I guess. Well, yeah. Let me answer your, your question directly. So, with Andrew Robinson, you know, who did most of the artwork except for the sequence in the Philippines, you know, we wanted to. Uh, it was a tricky line we were trying to just thre to tread. You know, we wanted to do something that was realistic. You know, that would feel, uh, you know, very filmic and 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 theatrical. Um, and uh, and not not be photo not not look like we were trying to copy photos, but that would have a sense of authenticity to it because it is a period piece and because a lot of these uh, faces and people and images and architecture and whatnot are are not just known but they're iconic. Um, so you know we wanted to make sure that we were capturing that stuff correctly, but we also wanted to bring some poetry to it to have some 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 artistic angles to it that were our own. So Andrew really had a, a tough job to tread there, and and while we certainly used some of the old Beatles images and cartoons as references, you know, we, we tried not to ape them too much. Um, that being said, the, the sequence in the Philippines, um, you know, the, that Kyle Baker draws, I mean, that is straight up an homage to the old Beatles cartoons um, that aired on television, not the Yellow Submarine cartoons, but the, the, um, the, the Beatles serial, serialized cartoons uh, that aired in the 1960s. Uh, you know, the Brian Epstein chaos in the Philippines sequence that, that just runs for seven pages in the book. But that, that one definitely is supposed to harken back to those old Beatles cartoons. So I guess the, the answer is kind of yes and no. Um, but <laughs> I, I hope at the end of the day we've created something in the fifth Beatle that the Beatles fans will, will can relate to and can enjoy and, and sort of pay homage to and, and tribute to some of the great elements of the Beatles, but, but also at the end of the day is something that's, that's uniquely our own. So... Um, when did you first decide you wanted to make this, this story or tell this story, and how long did it take you to do the research to, uh, well, if it's the first one done, you wanted, I'm quite sure you wanted to get it done right the first time. So how long did it take you to, for the whole entire process of making this novel or making this book, I should say? Yeah, so I've been working, I've been researching The Fifth Beetle literally for, for 21 years. Um, I discovered the Brian Epstein story when I was in business school looking for some business inspiration, dreaming of working in the entertainment industry and thinking that Brian and the Beatles were the team that kind of wrote and rewrote the rules of the pop music business. So that's how I came to the Brian Epstein story. And, you know, 21 years ago, it's um, there's no Wikipedia, there's no YouTube, there are none of these online resources that we have today. And as I mentioned um, earlier, you know, The Fifth Beetle is the only book in print about Brian. So rewinding 21 years ago, you'll see that, that there's 
years, it was very, very difficult to learn anything about his life. And so what I really resorted to was was interviews. You know, I didn't really have any other choice. You know, I tracked down people who knew Brian, and I called them up and basically said who I was. And at the time, as I said, I was a student. So I just said, hey, I'm a, I'm a young guy studying Brian's life. I find his life very inspiring, and I'm wanting to learn more about him, and I'm surprised there isn't more information available about him. And unsurprisingly, most of the people I spoke to at first were a little wary of me. <laughs> Who is this kid that's calling? And is this guy legit? And what's the story here? Um, but I think after uh, you know a couple of letters or a phone call or two, they realized that, that I was genuine, that my heart was in the right place. And they started talking to me about Brian. And literally, you know, over the past 20 years, you know, they, they opened up more and more to me about Brian's life and some of the more intimate aspects of his life. And I'm, I'm very happy to say many of these folks became friends over the years. And it was a, so, so that's kind of how it all started. It was about eight years ago in the wake of my having produced A Raisin in the Sun on Broadway and having enjoyed some success with that. And, uh, you know, really after that show, taking a step back and thinking, you know, what's the next story I want to tell? And realizing at that moment that the next story I wanted to tell was the Brian Epstein story. It was a wonderful story for all the reasons we talked about earlier and one that's been largely untold. And, um, you know, when I started the research, I was just a kid, a student, you know, with no, no, no background or no, uh, no qualifications to my name. But, but you know, by eight, eight years ago, I, I had grown in my career and had, uh, had become uh, still a young guy, but an older guy and, uh, and had enjoyed some success. You know, I, I was a Tony winning Broadway producer. I had, uh, you know, made good money, made good contacts, had critical acclaim. You know, I, 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 I knew what I was doing at that point. I was, I was able to tell a story creatively and to show that I could tell, tell stories creatively that, that might be tricky to pull off. And so at that moment, I, and I reached back out to all those, the people that, and, and at the time, as I said, many of them had become friends. And I said, look, you know, I wasn't being, I wasn't being disingenuous. Obviously, I was just a kid when I first spoke to you. I wasn't planning on, I just wanted some inspiration. But now, um, you know, I'm older and I can tell this story and it needs to be told it needs to be shared and uh, and I want to do this and and I'm happy to say they all said that's great you know if anyone's going to tell the story it should be you and, and how can we help and uh, that's when I set about wanting to um, to put the to put the story down on paper and um, you know you'd ask kind of why why I wanted to tell this story and and, and I think you'd actually said why a graphic novel and I, I mostly sort of got into you know why telling another Beatles story why another Beatles book I didn't really get into sort of the medium of graphic novels so I'll talk about that just for a minute but you know when I just when because it was at this moment when I decided I wanted to tell the story and I sort of got the sign off from all these people who'd been so helpful to me and who'd been really my primary resources and references for the book that I started to think about how do I want to tell the story you know at the time I was primarily a Broadway theater producer. Um, so, you know, uh, on the surface, you would think that that would be the, 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 the place that I would go because that's what I had, had, done, the, had done the most of and had, had the most success with. But as I started to think about the structure of the story, you know, as, as you know from, uh, from knowing the book, you know, we focus on the last seven years of Brian's life. You know, we do get into his, his, uh, his backstory through some dream sequences and exposition and hallucinations and whatnot, but, but for the most part, it focuses on, on the last seven years of his life. So it starts off in 1961 Liverpool, which to me is very gray, very dark, very industrial, very black and white. It's the way I thought of it. And it ends in 1967 London, which is the summer of love. It's the birth of the psychedelic era. It's quite literally a technicolor dream. So I thought of the Brian Epstein story, as esoteric as this may sound, as a, as a story that, that whose arc mirrors the arc of the movement from black and white to color. And, uh, you know, I don't know if that makes any sense to anyone other than me, um, but, but for whatever it's worth, it, you know, it's clear that I was thinking of the story in terms of color palette. And when you think in those terms, to me, that screams graphic novel and film. You know, to me, those are the, the, most, the most color visually oriented mediums. And, um, and so that's why we started developing both. And we really did, did develop both at the same time. I mean, m much has been talked about, you know, the, our forthcoming film, which we're working on uh, now, this year in 2014. But really, we did start working on the two uh, at the same time. And just the graphic novel, for a number of reasons, took on a life of its own and, and got completed first. But really, we envisioned both from, from, the day, from day one. 
So uh, the, the film uh, is coming out this year, I believe you just said. Um, the when film will shoot out? this year is the goal. Okay, it'll you know, shoot it'll, this year. Okay. The, the hope is it'll come out next year. Yep. We're going to be st- we're going to start casting Brian li- literally in a few weeks, in the beginning of February. Whenever when when the industry gets back from Sundance, everybody's a uh, Sundance right now. But in a few weeks, when when people are back and caught up, that's when we're going to start our casting process. Um, but you do have a director set up, I believe. Um, at least IMDb says Peyton Reed is set to direct it. Yeah, a lot of exciting stuff going on for the film. You know, I'll give you the highlights. Uh, Peyton Reed is indeed directing. He directed The Breakup, uh, Yes Man, and Bring It On. He's amazing and uh, very beloved in, in uh, actor and, and film circles. So we're very, very excited to have him on board. Um, Bruce Cohen is my co-producer. Uh, you know, I am uh, am very proud and of my work in theater, where I'm very well established. You know, I'll be the first to to admit humbly that uh, that film is a, a medium that I'm confident in, but but do not have enjoy the success I've had in theater. So, um, you know, I wanted to partner with somebody who has been there and done that, and that's Bruce Cohen. Uh, he's an Academy Award winner for American Beauty. Uh, he was nominated for the Academy Award two other times for Silver Linings Playbook and for Milk. Uh, He also produced Big Fish for Tim Burton. He's amazing. You know, to quote Bruce, uh, you know, we were on a panel at New York Comic Con, and so these are his words from that panel, not mine, but when he was talking about why the Brian Epstein story, he said, you know, well, I'm not from Liverpool, but I am gay and I am Jewish. Uh, You know, so the story is also very personal for Bruce. And, um, you know, so we have an amazing team. And most importantly, uh, in, in some ways, is we have the approval of the Beatles. And we did a deal with Sony ATV, who control the Lennon McCartney music publishing catalog, which is a very long-winded way of saying we have access to Beatles music for the film. Uh, literally, we are the first film about the band, first and only film in history uh, to have gotten their approval, to, to have had complete access uh, to their music. Um, you know, Stephanie, you're, as the Beatles expert, you'll know there have been a number of other Beatles films like Backbeat and Nowhere Boy, and uh, there have been a few few others. And if you go back and pay attention to those films, none of them have Beatles music in it, and it's because the, uh, none of those projects were able to get the, the approvals and, and, and negotiate the deals. And so we're very, very proud that we were able to do that. Um, so a lot of exciting things surrounding the film. You know, it's uh, with all that going on, it may not be a surprise that we are enjoying, uh, you know, a lot of excitement from uh, from Hollywood and UK film uh, industry circles. So, um, as I mentioned, we'll begin casting in, a, in about a, another handful of weeks, which should put us on track to uh, to shoot towards the end of the year. Well, that's fantastic. Well, let's switch over to some uh, Steph's questions. So, I was just um, had some questions about Brian Epstein and the. Beatles relationship. Um, so, the my first one is um, the Brian Epstein's managing style was very, very hands off, uh, which I, is not very common. So, um, how how do you see that really affecting the Beatles and their music and their artwork? Well, you know, it depends on, I guess, what you mean by hands-off. I mean, he was very hands-off when it came to the creative. You know, he never got involved in, in uh, picking which songs to put on a record or telling them how to write their songs or making pr- production notes or anything like that. You know, Brian is being inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame uh, with Andrew Lou Goldham this year. Uh, Andrew was a, a good friend of Brian and, and used to work for Brian. And brand, Andrew, in many ways, provided the same services for the Rolling Stones that, um, that Brian did for... Uh, for the Beatles, but one major difference between the two is that Andrew was very involved in the creative um, to the extent that Andrew produced a lot of the Rolling Stones' uh, early records. Um, Brian did not get involved in, in their songwriting. You know, there, there's a, a line in the book, uh, The Fifth Beatle, where he says, you know, you play your instrument, you focus on the music, you play your instruments, and I'll play the business as my instrument. Um, so in that sense, he was very hands-off. However, on, on the other sense, you know, as, as to, to go back to that quote, I will play the, the business as my instrument, he was very, very hands-on when it came to dealing with the music business. Um, and so how Brian creatively affected their music was, was uh, I, I think there is a direct connection, but it may not be as, as direct as, as one might think, you know, uh, in terms of record production and, and song notes. But Brian pushed the boundaries of the music business, which allowed the Beatles to push the boundaries of their their art. Um, and, you know, what do I mean by that? Uh, so I'll give you a couple of examples. You know, 
when the Beatles were, uh, were you know, there was a, a moment in, in, in the, you know, 1964, uh, 1965, when they were the, the biggest boy band on the planet. That's really what they, they became. They were, they, were, uh, they were a huge boy band. They had uh, enjoyed an uh, unprecedented mainstream pop success. And what the industry wanted them to do and, and what the industry still wants their successful boy bands to do even today is cash in, you know, to put it crudely. You know, tour the biggest venues you can, put out as many records you can, put out holiday records, compilation records, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, cash in on your success because boy bands – typically don't have very lengthy careers. And instead of doing that, you know, Brian said, we're not going to do that. We're not going to go on all these things. The, the boys want to study Eastern instrumentation, and George wants to learn the sitar. And, you know, you can imagine at the time the record industry thought that was absurd and insane. But, um, but Brian, you know, convinced them to allow the Beatles to do that. And as a result of that, you know, we got the second wave of Beatles albums, which, you know, culminated in, or one could say it peaked in some ways, with a masterpiece like Sgt. Pepper. So, you know, quite literally, if, if Brian had not pushed the industry uh, to allow the Beatles to have that kind of artistic freedom, the band would never have uh, had never made those kind of records. You know, another manager might have said, "Look, we need to we need to go on this tour and we need to write more songs like we're currently writing because that's what the labels want from us." You know, um, more about Sgt. Pepper's is, you know, the Beatles had this idea for the cover. You know, they wanted to do that that iconic cover, which, as we know today, is, is considered one of the greatest album covers of all time and a work of art, uh, much like the songs that, that are underneath it. But the, the record labels thought that cover was crazy. You know, that the, the, they couldn't put all the fa these images of famous people on the cover, and, you know, they, they were unwilling to print that cover without permission. And, and Brian thought the cover was worthwhile, and he went to every single – person on that cover who was still alive or to their estates in the cases of people who had passed away and secured permission, which was incredibly difficult. It took an incredibly long period of time. And, uh, you know, at the time, the, the music industry didn't understand what he was doing. They said, why are you wasting all this time on an album cover? You know, album covers are not that important. They're just little posters for the music. Um, but Brian believed, much as the Beatles believed, that, that album covers were as, as, as artistic a statement as the songs that were underneath it. So, you know, I, I would argue that Brian was an incredibly hands-on manager, um, but he was hands-on about the business, you know, about getting about, – about pushing the boundaries of the business to allow his artists to put, push the boundaries of art. Um, you know, and the, the areas that he was, was hands off in were the creative areas or the, the traditionally – or what's traditionally considered the creative areas. Well, so uh, with the business aspect, um, he was clearly – a great manager in many ways and um, there's also though those a couple of those contracts that are still affecting Paul McCartney today where he, like, he has to pay to play his the songs he wrote when he was with the Beatles um, so how how would such a great manager get them into those types of spots and the spots of like you know the, the you're talking about like Paul McCartney losing his publishing and whatnot yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, the the there's there's a I mean the simplest answer to that is that all of that stuff happened after Brian passed away. I mean, I don't want to be too disingenuous, but like I, I believe if Brian had lived, none of that would ever have happened. I mean the the Beatles music publishing was very much within their control when Brian was alive. It was only after he passed away that, that no one was really watching the ship. Um, you know, the, the, I don't want to get too carried away with stuff that's not related to the book, but, you know, after Brian died, you know, three of the Beatles wanted, uh, wanted Alan Klein to rep them. Paul McCartney wanted Lee Eastman, who was about to become his father-in-law, to rep them. You know, there was all sorts of internal bickering. There was really no one manning the ship. Um, but, you know, Brian had set a number of mechanisms in place. Uh, to allow the band to have retained that kind of artistic control that we had just talked about. It was really only after he passed away that the Beatles uh, found themselves um, falling into those kind of spots, letting people purchase up their music publishing to the extent that they lost it um, and, and that sort of thing. But if you study the, you know, again, I don't want to get too much into the nitty-gritty of the deals, but if you study the deals that Brian had cut for the Beatles, you know, he, he had protected them from that. Uh, it was only after he passed away that that those that all those things started to fall apart. So I guess one question I have is, you know, he's very influential when it comes to the Beatles and very influential in the music industry. And when it comes to the Beatles, everything about the Beatles, you know, there's books about, as you said, you know, random people who knew them. Why was his story so 
forgotten or not covered, or was it just did did people just not like him in the industry? Like, why was his story the one that's not being written till now? You know, there, there. Are, I mean, we could talk about that alone for for uh, for an hour. There's a number of reasons, you know, but I think the largest one is is a personal reason, and it's the fact that he was gay at a time where it was against the law. So, you know, people who knew Brian best, who who knew him well, knew him intimately, um, didn't want to talk about his life because they knew that, uh, you know, during his lifetime. Um, you know, certain intimate aspects of, of his life could have gotten their friend thrown in jail. And certainly after he passed away and the laws were repealed, it still was, was decades on before it became socially acceptable. Like it may have all of a sudden become uh, legal, but it wasn't acceptable. Um, you know, and I could see just by talking to, to the people that I, that I did my research with that it really was, you know, I started talking to them maybe 20 years ago, but it really was only in the past, you know, five to seven years that they really started opening up to me about the Brian Epstein story. So I think in a lot of ways it's just that people, people didn't want to talk about his life story because – you know that they didn't want to want to get him in trouble, or you know, talking about you know his 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 personal life um, would have immediately, uh, in the, in the eyes of the public, you know, was felt like left a bad taste in people's mouth. I mean, it, you know, today we still have a long way to go, but I think today, when you say like, oh, it's the story of a you know the, a gay manager, you know, the, the the minute you hear gay doesn't doesn't necessarily make you uh, you know shut down and not want to hear more or, or have some kind of negative uh, knee jerk reaction, but you know in the 60s and in the 70s and even part of the 80s that w that w would have been the case um so i think that's a large part of it um you know uh stephanie you 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 know we were talking at length about you know is his style hands on or hands off i mean w one thing that it it definitely was was shielding you know i mean again going back to the line like you play your i'll play the business as my instrument you know the line that follows it is he says only you'll never have to hear it and and that was definitely a part of Brian's uh, business strategy with the Beatles is you concentrate on your art and I'll take care of the business to the extent that you don't have to think about it. You, I don't want you to worry about it. You know, I'll take care of all that stuff. And, you know, I think that that was a very successful business tactic in that it allowed the Beatles to really focus on pushing the boundaries of their art, which was the point. Um, but it didn't, it may not have served Brian's legacy very well because the Beatles didn't really uh, know or appreciate what he did for them. I mean, it really only is in with the, within the past decade that, um, that the, the surviving Beatles have started to say nice things about Brian and have started to acknowledge his legacy. I mean, Paul McCartney has very famously said, you know, if anyone was the fifth Beatle, it was Brian. And certainly we slap that quote on everything we do with the fifth Beatle. But that quote was said in 1999, you know, you know, almost 30, what, 32 years after Brian Epstein passed away. You know, it took Paul 32 years uh, to, to, to say if anyone was the fifth Beatle, it was Brian. And, 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 you know, I don't think that's because the Beatles were ungrateful um, or were mean or, or wanted to take the credit themselves. I think it's that they didn't know. You know, it's, you know, you mentioned those tight spots that they found themselves in. I think it's only been over the past several decades that they, once they started to find themselves in some tight spots, that they realized, like, what Brian did for them. I think they, they took a step back and they realized that none of this would have happened probably if Brian was still alive. He really did a lot for us. He just didn't tell us what he was doing. You know, he, he let us not worry about it, but there was a lot of stuff he was doing behind the scenes. And I think, you know, with the Beatles not talking or acknowledging what Brian did, it was pretty easy for the rest of the world to fall in line and, and not talk about what Brian did. Um, and, and, again, the people that actually knew better and that, that probably could have raised their hands and said, hold on a second, like, this guy was, was really impactful, those were people who knew Brian well and wanted to keep his story out of the public uh, eye for, for a number of personal and not professional reasons. So, you know, it's complicated. Again, I, I think this is a topic we could probably – go on and on and say, well, you know, why has this story been so unsung? You know, we get to probably talk about that for a long time, but but I think those are the, the, the quick and easy answers. I mean, it's wonderful that he's being inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame now, but why now? You know, why not years ago? And I think it's it's because his story is finally, people are ready to hear it. You know, in some ways, you know, being, I'm obviously somebody that cares deeply about Brian, Brian's legacy, and, you know, the, the flippant part of me has said, this is a story that should have been told 30 years ago, and should it have been? Yes, of course it should have been, but in a lot of ways, I also think, you know, it's a story whose time has come. You know, speaking about my own project, I don't know that I could have put out The Fifth Beatle 10 years ago, maybe not even five years ago. 
um, or certainly not not to the degree of success that it's been enjoyed. You know, the book debuted at number five on the New York Times bestsellers. Two weeks after that, it rocketed all the way to number one. It's been almost universally critically praised. It's doing tremendously well, and and I think that's because people want to hear this story. They're receptive to it, you know, and and I think there was a period of time where if you'd started to just get into the very basics of his story, a lot of people would have shut down or, or people who weren't Beatles fans would have just not been interested. So I, th- I think it, it's a story whose time has finally come. I hope that's not too long-winded a way of answering your question. Oh, that was that was great. That was great. Thank you. Uh, so with John Lennon's um, relationship with Brian Epstein, uh, do you think that if John Lennon had lived longer, maybe Brian Epstein's legacy might have been uh, – spoken about sooner? If John had lived longer, would would Brian's legacy have been, been sort of gotten into sooner? Is that the question? Yeah. Do you think John might have Oh, uh, you know, it's so hard to answer these kind of what if questions. Um, you know, but but you know, I I I'll answer I'll answer the question. Like I I think I think yes. You know, I mean, J- John was probably the Beatle that was closest to him. Uh, John and Paul both, but probably in 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 some ways, John was was the closest. And um, you know, I I think probably I think you know John would have probably you know it took Paul until ni- 1999. It, it probably John might have gotten around a little bit sooner, you know, or, or maybe a good bit sooner. Um, you know, so so I think there's a good chance of that. And and I you know I think Yoko Ono has been very um, very warm and supportive of of efforts to. Uh, you know, to um, preserve and, and acknowledge Brian's legacy and role in the band, and, and I suspect this is not based on anything she's told me or anything any of her reps have told me, but I suspect that's because she knows how much Brian meant to John, um, and Brian did mean a lot to John. You know, John very very famously said or uh, once that there were only two people in his entire life that he listened to and that he would do what they told him, and that was Yoko and Brian. You know, and and so so I I think you're probably I think what you're getting at is probably accurate. I think if if John had lived longer than he had, you know, the world might have seen might have heard more about the Brian Epstein story sooner. And and certainly if you've got a spokesperson like John Lennon, that might have cut through some of the uh, some of the obstacles that might that uh, that I've just been referring to in, in in getting the story told. But who? But at the end of the day, who knows? Yeah. yeah. You know, who really knows? John, John, let's not get into a John Lennon discussion, but I'm a huge John Lennon fan, but I should, you know, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm sure anyone who's even a, a moderate John Lennon fan will, will know that, that he was a very mixed bag. You know, on one hand, he was all about peace and love, and on another hand, he, you know, he treated certain members of his family very badly. He could be very acerbic. He could be a rabble rouser. He would say things that were untrue just to get a rise out of people. You know, I mean, John, John was a very, very complicated character, so... What, you know, trying to second guess what John Lennon might have done had he lived, you know, that's that's a pretty tricky road to go down. Um, but but being but but to answer your question, I, I think he probably would have. But at the end of the day, who knows? You know, who knows what John Lennon might have done had he lived? So we have uh, two questions to wrap it up. Um, the first one is a little about the movie. Um, what type of movie are we looking at? Because like I know recently, as far as like Beatles related stuff, was that. Across the universe musical, and you know, is this um, supposed to be a movie that's like the '60s or '50s and '60s style, or is it like a modern-day retelling of like a biopic that we've had recently? Like, how is this movie going to be? What type of movie are we to expect? Yeah, I mean, for in terms of tone and style, you know, it's we're not using the graphic novel as a storyboard, certainly, but it but it will have the kind of uh, kind of tone and style of the graphic novel to some extent visually, um, or or I suspect it will is what I should say. You know, uh, Peyton Reed is a very wonderful director and a visual director. You know, one of his his uh, his films that are not as known as The Yes Man or The Breakup or. or Excuse me, or bring it on is down with love, and down with love is a is, is a sixties period piece. It's it's um, U S. and it's the U S. in the sixties, but there's quite a bit of fantasy uh, elements in that, and you'll see you'll kind of you know for people who've seen that you can kind of see a little bit of how he treats the nineteen sixties, but it's definitely going to have a very visual flair to it, um, so it's not going to be a straightforward biopic in that sense. 
But at the end of the day, it is also a period piece, and so we do want to get some of the architecture and, and the wardrobe and all of that stuff correct. You know, we're not trying to do some sort of modern retelling of the story. We do want to set it in its context of the 1960s. Um, but the 1960s are a fabulous period. As I said, it's the period where the, the psychedelic era is given birth. So, um, so there's a lot of visual and, and, and fantastical fun one, one can have uh, with the medium there. Um, you know, it's uh, the film will also, as I said, we have we have we do have access to Beatles music. So certainly, since we have that access, you can bet we're going to use it. So the film will have a number of musical sequences that that you don't see in the book. Uh, so we're very excited to be able to do that. Um, but you know, the film, you know, the the way I describe it in terms of narrative, you know, I think of it less as a music biopic and more of an inspirational human story. So in some ways, it's less like Ray or Walk the Line, and it's more like Rocky or Billy Elliot. You know, it's the it's the the story of the least likely guy to succeed, you know, going the distance in their chosen field. Um, you know, and uh, and I hope that much like Rocky and Billy Elliot, if we do our job correctly, you know, you don't need to be a fan of the Beatles to be a fan of the Brian Epstein story. I mean, certainly you don't need to be a fan of boxing or ballet uh, to like Rocky or Billy Elliot, respectively. And, um, you know, I'm a huge Beatles fan myself, and I think that this movie, and, and I hope this book, is, is a particular treat for, for Beatles fans. But, um, but if we're doing our jobs correctly, it's, uh, it's meant for anyone who's, who's in, in, interested in an inspirational human story. You know, as cheesy as it may sound, I always say anyone who's ever want, wanted to believe in a dream, that's who this book is made for, and that's who this film will be made for. Um, and, and I, you know, uh, one more comment I'll say visually is, you know, we, we'd like to also, you know, there are a number of, if, if, as you know from the book, there are a number of sort of fantasy sequences in the book and similar. I, I've written the screenplay myself. I'm the screenwriter on it, and, and we've, I've done that as well. There are a number of fantasy sequences in the film also. So in some ways, you know, we were, I was looking to films like Pink Floyd's The Wall uh, in terms of our visual treatment. If you remember The Wall, there are a number of musical sequences that, um, that are not characters breaking out into song, like you might expect from somebody who, who has had a career on Broadway. So I, I will, I will, I will, def, I will deflate any fears. This will not be a character's breaking out into song kind of musical. Um, but there will be a number of musical sequences in which uh, you know the music propels the narrative forward in the way that the music did in Pink Floyd's The Wall, um, with some really uh, interesting visuals, as, uh, you know, behind that. Um, but all that being said, you know, Peyton Reed is an amazing director, and I want Peyton to have the freedom to, to be a director on this, you know. So, so um, you know, he hasn't uh, started doing press for Fifth Beetle, but when, when, he, when he does, and he will, you know, I'd love for you to ask him that question, and, and he may give you a, a more succinct answer. But certainly what I just said is what we're going for. Have any of the surviving Beatles expressed interest in like, being involved in some way, or is that... Well, we've, we've not reached out to them uh, to, you know, to be involved in the film in any kind of official capacity, except in as much as we have to get their approvals in order to get the Beatles, the music rights. So they are all uh, very aware of, of the film. Um, you know, the, the Apple Corps had to sign off on our script before, uh, before Sony ATV would even talk to us. Um, so certainly the, the surviving Beatles are aware of the film project or are intimately aware of what we're doing with the film and how we're going to tell the story. Um, but we've not asked them to be, be directly involved in, in any further capacity. We may, um, you know, uh, not, not sure how that's going to play itself out right now. Um, we are very, very lucky and fortunate to enjoy their support and their goodwill. Um, you know, Paul McCartney in particular has read The Fifth Beatle and has, has uh, said very warm things about it. He's, he is a fan. Um, we're very, very happy to, to acknowledge that. Um, it goes a long way towards giving our story legitimacy. Um, and uh, I'm sure the Beatles fans are relieved to hear that also. Um, but Paul definitely has read the book and, and loved it. Um, so, you know, we'll see. We'll see. We've not, as I said, I've not reached out to them to ask for anything in particular other than for their approval on music rights. And, um, and you know, so, so far they've been, been wonderful at anything I've asked them. So we'll see. Okay, so the last thing we're going to ask is um, if people want to get hold of you or get more information about the Fifth Beetle, 
or purchase it, where can people find it for sale, and how can they, if they have more questions, um, how can they get them answered and so on? God bless you for asking. Um, so the book, uh, it did come out on November 19th, so it is it is avail- available for sale. Uh, it should be at, uh, at any local comic shops or, or wherever good books are sold, as they say. Um, online, it is definitely available at Amazon, at Barnes & Nobles, and at IndieBound. And uh, if you are listening in a foreign territory, it is available in a number of foreign territories already. Um, and again, Amazon.co.uk. Um, I believe the French Amazon is Amazon.fr, um, but but it is available at the the, the French version of Amazon. Um, it's going to be released in Germany shortly as well. So there, um, but it's certainly very easy to find. And and uh, and you know, the the easiest place to get more information about the Fifth Beetle is at our website, which is fifthbeetle.com. We do have a store at that website, which will give you links to uh, to purchase the book at various places. And um, we have a very active Facebook community. Uh, we are the Fifth Beetle on Facebook. Um, we are also very very active on Twitter, which is um, at Fifth Beetle. Um, and for more information about me, I, I'm also very available on Twitter, which is at Vivek J. Tiwari. And uh, my company's website is uh, Tiwari, Ent, T-I-W-A-R-Y-E-N-T.com. So I would say those are probably all the, uh, the best places to find out more about what we're doing. And, and we will uh, be making a lot of announcements about the film in the, uh, the upcoming months. So I, I would encourage any of your listeners um, to please uh, join our mailing list or follow us on Twitter and friend us on Facebook. And, and you'll, you'll be uh, kept, kept in, the new, in, the, in the know on very breaking news because I suspect there will be a lot of breaking news over the next few months. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, sir. And uh, this has been this has been a real thank pleasure. Thank you, guys. And I, I wanted to a- ask you about a little bit more about Bombad Radio. I mean, um, you know, no no Star Wars. Yeah, I'm a huge Star Wars fan. <laughs> You know, uh, uh, I love what you guys are doing. It, uh, I took a look at the site and, and 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 the Facebook page, and you're doing some wonderful stuff. Thank you. Yeah, we don't. It, 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 Star Wars fits with. With some guests, but others like this is about the Beatles. So we <laughs> yeah. Star Wars. yeah, I don't know how I can work Star Wars into that, uh, other than to say, I guess you know, I I grew up with Star Wars and the Beatles, and you know, to me both were were very visual. Um, but I'm a massive Star Wars fan. So uh, well, if you want to be on again to talk some Star Wars, we can do that. Oh man, I'll always talk Star Wars. I don't know that I have anything professional to add, but I'll certainly, I'll certainly opine, uh, uh, you know, as, as much as you like. My, uh, my five-year-old is, uh, is, is very, very into it. We're, we, we are working our way through the movies, and we're, we're just at Revenge of the Sith now. He's doing, we're doing it in, in the chronology of release. So we did the original trilogy first and, and then started working our way through the prequels. Um, so he's almost through them all. My, my two-year-old doesn't get it as much, but she, but she also is a, is a huge Star Wars fan. She learned her ABCs from Star Wars ABCs. She says her favorite character is Lukey. So, uh, so they're, they are, you'll, be, you'll be happy to hear that we already have some budding Star Wars fans in our, in, in, in our world, and, and, and I suspect you will as well very soon. Yeah. Oh, definitely. He already has a Star Wars book. <laughs> yep, fantastic. There's a number, as if you if you're not already aware, there are a number, a great number, of uh, of Star Wars stuff for kids and Star Wars books and all sorts of things. I mean, it, you'll have great fun as 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 parents who are also Star Wars fans. For for Christmas, my my five year old, I got him the uh, the Lego Death Star. I don't know if you've seen this thing, but it's literally like a three thousand piece. Lego kit. I mean, it's going to take us months to build, but we're having endless amounts of fun with it. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Some of the, the big Lego kits, when I was a kid, like, I, I don't think I ever actually like built them. I just built other things with them. Yeah. Yeah, we are working our I mean, the, the, the manual for the Lego Death Star is like, it's thicker than the Fifth Beetle, for example. It's like a 200-page book. I mean, it's, wow. it's, it's, it's awesome. <laughs> it's awesome. Wow. Yeah. It, okay. came, it came with 24 minifigures. You know, including a Dianoga. There's a little trash compactor with a Dianoga. It's uh, wow. it's a pretty it's a pretty awesome item. Well, if you ever want to be on the discuss hours, like the discussion's the funnest part anyway. With when it comes to fans, we just like talking about it and our theories and our you know thoughts on different things. That's the best part. I will have to be professional input or anything like that because. Yeah, please think think about me. I mean, if you're ever doing a show and and yeah, and you're looking for an extra fan to 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 
throw down some opinions, I would would love to be on. I'm a, I'm a pretty big fan of both the movies and the expanded universe. So, I mean, you know, um, I guess one one connection is, uh, you know, um, I guess they're losing the license this year, but Dark Horse, you know, who publishes the Fifth Beetle, has been the longtime publisher of the um, of the Star Wars comics. And you know the the dark horse they they have uh they love um this book, and Mike Richardson, their CEO is a huge Beatles fan, and the support for the fifth Beatle at Dark Horse has been you know unparalleled they've been amazing, and that's really why I signed with Dark Horse is because they it was clear that they were going to treat the fifth Beatle as a huge labor of love um but I will acknowledge that it was also uh, it wasn't the main reason by or any you know by any stretch of the imagination, but it was pretty pretty freaking cool for me to think that I was on the same publisher as the Star Wars books. Um, and I don't know if you guys read the, read the Star Wars comics, but they've done some amazing, amazing work with uh, with Star Wars over the years at Dark Horse. Indeed they have. So uh, I, we got to wrap this up just a little bit because we got to get ready to go. But yeah, thank cool. you very much. Well, I'll get you on sometime to talk some Star Wars because that'll be fun. I'd love to do that. I'd love to do that. So yeah, thank you guys so much. It was really a joy talking to you. And, um, and, and good luck over the next few months to both of you. <laughs> Thank you. You too, and have a have a great day. You too. Bye, guys.